Okay, we're recording now, and we're going to go live in just a moment. What we're going to do is call it the game theory of our predicament. The twilight of an empire. And we're going to go ahead and start with that, I believe. Let's just give it a shot, shall we? Hello, everybody. So I believe we're now live and recording. Dual purpose. We're going to try this out for a change. See how this goes. We're going to talk about some game theory. This is going to be relatively brief. I just wanted this to be on both channels. So without further ado, here we go. Let's imagine the Hawk Dove game, shall we? Let's talk about if we could have an ideal society, you know, so here's, here's us. If I, if I am a dove and I happen to be in an, envir in an environment full of doves, rep replete with doves, well supplied with doves. Abundant doves. Then, and and we we want victory. We want a vole, perhaps a vole. We want the thing, the desiderata, the desideratum. Singular. So we want victory. We get half of it because we're gonna we're gonna share it. We don't have claws or fangs. We're not a raptor. We're a dove. We're kind of an idiot. We bob our head around. We move around kind of funny. Not the best at flying. Not the best at seeing. But we get half. It's pretty fair. Okay. But you know what? Fair enough. That doesn't really happen. We don't have those environments. You're never going to get rid of the hawks. You're never going to get rid of people who are cheaters, free riders, whatever. You're never going to get rid of your enemies, your hawks. Okay? So, you are a dove and you're playing a hawks game. You lose. Plain and simple. You lose. You don't have a leg to stand on. It tears you up if you try to compete with it, so you don't. It gets the whole vol. It gets the desideratum. It gets the thing. It gets victory, all the spoils, to the victor, to the hawk. So, a lot of doves die, a lot of doves go out of business, a lot of doves end up in prison, a lot of doves end up in the military, or, you know, uh, in a field somewhere, I mean... And in terms of humanity, these are your potential. I, I think Einstein has some kind of quote, you know, it's your Picassos out there, your Michelangelos, your Da Vinci's just sowing fields or stuck in a warehouse somewhere. The human potential that we're missing out on is vast, illimitable, because humans have value by virtue of their mere existence. And we will inductively work backward in an empirical way from that point. And we will be able to demonstrate that you can mine a person's phenotype, their physiology for a unique mode of being, a thought, a unique protein. Something's gonna be able to justify every individual existence just by virtue of its being. I digress. If you're a dove in a Hawks game, you lose. And that's a lot of what's happening now. But there's actually another... Uh, instance that's a lot like what's happening now and we'll get to that let's think of this like a progression sort of okay this is ball and stick we're playing with games here game theory this is a model but we're gonna we're gonna roll with it it's pretty powerful fair share ideal society not gonna happen doesn't happen we can approach this we can try to get this but Maybe we we want to have teeth, and maybe we want to make a new environment somewhere, somehow. A new game where those who have teeth and those who have claws divvy up their spoils. Because what happens to the doves 
if uh, they just get nothing and all the hawks are too many, too powerful, doves die. Okay, now it's a hawk eat hawk world. It's a hawk versus hawk world, or it's going to be anyway, because now, now we're a hawk. But if we're up against that dove, it's important to remember we win. We got a lot of incentive to be a hawk. Got a lot of reason to be that hawk. In that, in the human scenario, in our frame, in our hermeneutics, however, we have every reason. We have every heteronomy, law and incentive, and the parameterization of homeostasis, our very will to live, sees that the compulsion would be such as to justify our behaviors with victory. Why not be the hawk? Why not take it all from the doves? All right? You win versus the dove every time. You get victory. You get the bull, the desideratum, the thing. You get it. Okay. Okay. So just be a hawk. Well, now it's a hawk eat hawk world. And this, I think, is a lot like the environment we're in. We have a lot of predatory structures and institutions that are lording over our lives. We've got choice architecture. We've got nudges. You can look those up in the psychological literature. We have people who are deeply invested in seeing that we're algorithmically tweaked to behave, you know, just as our environments would suggest we should. And we are creatures of genetics, of DNA course and our whole transcriptome too don't forget the rna but we are significantly shaped by our environment if we switch the economic environment if we change the heteronomy if we change the educational environment if we change our cultural environment we can be better we can be amazing humans we can do a lot with this but in the current milieu in this hawk eat hawk world let's talk about this scenario you get half of the vol of victory, but there's a cost to it as well. You have to fight. Everyone, everything is fighting each other, whether it be corporation versus corporation, an individual versus a corporation. Oh, and think about this with that hawk dove scenario. So I'm a dove, I'm a lowly wage worker, and my corporation hawk wage theft. Boom, there it is, gone. You can't, you can't prosecute that. You look like these scenarios exist where they're monopoly. Boom. Cox communications, whoever you are, whatever you are. Boom. Can't, you can't win. It might even be providing you a legitimate service. Facebook, Twitter, whatever the monopoly is. Tesla, the charging infrastructure, the airlines, the media. The oil corporations, the meat packing, like the meat distributors, the baby formula, right? That was only done by three or four corporations. So the hawks win. They do zero you out if you're a dove. So we're in this hawk eat hawk scenario. There's a fight. Okay. Traditionally, it's supposed to be something like the government. You know, which is just kind of the hawk itself in plenty of cases, I'll grant you that all the time, is going to incur a cost on corporations or the kinds of hawks that are going to really go out for your everyday doves. You're, you're just plain working people or however, just people trying to live their lives. Okay, it's supposed to incur a cost, but there are other ways these costs are incurred. There are other ways these costs accumulate. And we've taken the calling many of those externalities. <laughs> you know, that's not the corporation hawk's responsibility to look at the externalities. We'll kneecap the regulatory industry. You got this new, you know, decision about the EPA not being able to regulate at all in terms of carbon emissions. So its reason for existing is essentially a moot point at, in the current legal environment. 99% of all of the humans that are alive, breathe unclean air. So I kind of ask in that environment, what else matters? That's one of those important facts. You're not going to find a control group for plastic in humans' blood. You're not going to find a control group for PFAS and PFOS. These are, these are terrible things we've done. And they are 
real costs to the modus operandi that we've been running with. They will eventually collapse the system. They will eventually subsume the entire game. Because the costs will override the benefits and the ability of hawks or doves to weather the storm, so to speak. To stay, you know, with the analogy here, the metaphor. So, we can make a different environment. We can... Only by virtue of collective action, only by virtue of solidarity, we can confront the hawks. We have to be somewhat hawkish ourselves. There's a cost to all of this, but if we, the, the ultimate cost is if we let our heteronomy run away with the show, if we let our law and incentive run away with the show here, we're going to end up burning the whole thing down one way or another. What democracy are we trying to preserve here? What's left? When you have oligarchs, when you have an oligarchy, when you have a plutocracy, what democracy is left? After Citizens United, what democracy was left? Now you have a judicial branch playing a legislative and potentially... Yeah. enforcement role at least the term in terms of the language it's using it's speaking in we're in this game of doves and hawks we have killed off the doves put them out of business they've lost the game we all have an incentive <laughs> to be cutthroat to be out for ourselves in a purely heteronymous way and Marx said that he looked at the bourgeois and he said you must forgive them they're acting purely by their heteronomy and they've brought us to the greatest point in history so far but its internal machinations regardless will still undo itself just like in the twilight of rome and athens just like in yugoslavia just like in the weimar republic weimar germany just like in weimar america and weimar America. I actually, let's spend some time, let's spend some time discussing Weimar America. Now that we've gone through this a little bit. Consider some parallels, if you will. Consider runaway inflation. A parallel between Weimar America and Weimar Germany. Consider immiserated masses. Many who are jobless or who have a job that's not actually furnishing forth the ability to live, certainly not thrive, not even to live, free of stresses, major, life-crippling stresses, immiserated masses, all-time low trust in institutions, and deservedly so, because the institutions are corrupt, and the mechanisms that were supposed to protect people have become corrupted, and are selling those people out and not defending the democracy or the norms or the legal structures from the autocratic seizure of power. These are some powerful analogs we're working with here. We have a very socially accepting, permissive, um, we're tr trying to trend socioculturally toward an egalitarian ideal. Those are the books that have to go. Those are the lessons that have to go. Those are the classes that need to be persecuted. Human rights. You know, where's the discussion about this? Human rights are non-negotiable. Human rights are non-negotiable. We need to remember that. We need to be we need to be adamant about that. We can't take any of our basic human rights for granted. In a time of fascism. In a time where the democracy has failed. It's over for that democracy. What are we going to actually do to change the milieu? What are we going to actually do to get off of this course?
We know where Weimar Germany went with its misery and its politics and religion of despair. Disaffection. And we're taking ours to very similar dark places. Let's stop before we find ourselves blaming ourselves, asking ourselves, how did we let it happen? What else matters when 99% of humans breathe unclean air? What else matters when we are undoing basic human rights? What else matters when civil discourse is dead? And rationalism and reason are not behind the driver's seat of our governance. What else matters? Right? When the therapists can't fix the climate, they can't fix the gunshots, they can't fix the corruption, and the, the darkly woven web of capitalism will rear its ugly head in every corner, in every domain of these discussions. It is central to all of it because we are just building these costs. The ocean is too acidic. All right, but you know what? A lot of people don't care about that one. A lot of people don't care about the air either. Amazon rainforest will be gone on this path by or before the 2030s. We will have iceless Arctic summers. These are the tremendous costs. We will have wars over water. We will have hundreds of thousands of people. Hundreds of millions. As climate refugees, as 20% of what is now habitable landmass on Earth becomes uninhabitable. In the midst of our destruction of human rights and our backward sliding to the Middle and Dark Ages, we need to restore reason. We need to have solidarity. We need to speak as things are. The democracy is over. The democracy is done. The democracy has failed. We have a corrupt plutocracy run by oligarchs and plutocrats. That is the baseline. We must speak things as they are. Human rights are in danger. Our precious brothers and sisters are in danger. Our precious brothers and sisters have been dying needlessly and at greater expense than is needed. The numbers have been crunched multiple times. Medicare for all saves more people for less money. Anything else is cruel stupidity. And that's the point. Cruel inanity that forges apathy and creates the misery that foments the rage and disaffection that takes us to fascism. We need to consider what we're doing and where we're going and what's important. We do not have the intellectual and moral ethical luxuries to be talking about and doing other things when we are destroying human rights, and when discourse is dead, and when 99% of humans breathe unclean air, and when we can't find a control group for the plastics and the PFAS and the PFAS, etc., etc. People my age, with less to lose than the people who are older, need to start acting out. We need to act out. We need to be wild. And we need to be un com uncomfortably erratic and emphatic. And we must be serious. We must be impolitely, civilly disobedient. At least. At the very least. If we want anything to change for the better. Otherwise, we're going to be dead and done before you know it.